Welcome to the new breed of business. Today, we are going to further talk about inflation. And our subject is watching Israel and what does Israel have to do with inflation? So welcome. Um, I, I'm just facilitating a discussion here amongst you. We want to hear from you about what are your impressions in some of this material. Uh, we've been talking about ways within the church and specifically ways we can, uh, in a new wineskin approach, can take back matters uh, when it comes to commerce, economy, finances, where we're no longer just thinking of business as ministry is, I just go run all of those secular companies and we run them the same way with the Babylonian business practices. No, God is actually saying we need to, as the church, unify together and bring back in-house into the biblical construct of economy. Sometimes I refer to this as Boaz's economy or God's economy and act differently. And, and, and that necessitates us to change and shift. So we're watching the things that are happening on the earth today and how that's everything's shifting. And that God is calling the church into a greater place of intimacy with him to understand we can get through whatever we need to together with the Holy Spirit and the power of God. And that includes practical implementation matters, uh, which is, requires administration and organization and planning and execution. It also requires us to be constantly on our face in prayer, to intercede. It requires us to come together in a greater unity uh, across the church. We might have theological differences, but we need to practically work together with one another to uh, help people uh, in a time of difficulty. We are faced now, but it's, it's going to increase. That's what the Bible shows us here as we approach Jesus's return. So welcome everybody today. That's our topic. I have in here uh, some news about what happened in Israel. Israel recently announced, and this is related to it all, um, the re- uh, distribution of their foreign currency reserves. So what are foreign currency reserves? Foreign currency reserves are there so that a country can settle its import-export um, uh, payments as well as it's uh, defending its currency if it floats against other currencies. Why is this important? Because there's been a trend away from the U.S. dollar being the world's reserve currency towards a basket of of uh, currencies or other currencies. And this has come in fits and starts, but it is a trend and it seems to be very much a real thing that is now being almost exacerbated by the war that's going on between Ukraine and Russia. And the sanctions that have resulted in it are almost stressing the system, trying to put in place the US dollar as well. If you don't behave as we would like you to, we are going to economically punish you. And so that seems like it's a fair thing. Hey, instead of like putting American soldiers on the ground and our blood or any country's soldiers on the ground, let's do it with, with economics. But the trouble, of course, is there is the unintended consequences of that. And one of the unintended consequences of that is there is, it's, we're, we're dealing from a weaker hand than we've had in the past. And it's essentially pushing people away from, in a, lot, in a large measure, using the U.S. dollar to settle everything globally. So for years, we, in globalization, we, we promoted Bretton Woods, um, open uh, economies, uh, free trade across uh, countries. What we did essentially was, was open up the world without really fully understanding the political dynamic the sort of nation power dynamic that that implies. So for years, we had low inflation because essentially we were outsourcing our jobs to lower cost of wage countries and enjoying the benefits of that. So we, we as America and other Western nations have enjoyed the benefit of all this global trade, but the consequence of that is now we're, we're somewhat exposed because when we see a country like China has acted the way they have, which is uh, asymmetrically. They're not behaving like a normal open free market. Everything's freely moves in and out. They're trying to, if you will, sanction how they um, look at their economy, their goods, their 
commodities and their currency. So you, there's not a free ability to just invest and take out your investment in China. There's not a free ability to um, just trade in and out of the yuan um, without any kind of restriction. There are many restrictions, there are many, if you will, sanctions that China puts on that. So they've kind of set themselves up in a superior position, which now they're taking advantage of geopolitically. So we have a, we're, we're exposed. We're exposed because of that. And now the sanctions are pushing that exposure and Israel's reacting. Israel's saying, hey, objectively, uh, the US dollar is really more and more on shaky ground and we need to look to other currencies in order to properly fund ourselves for the future for trade. Why is this important? Well, what Israel's doing and how God is restoring Israel is really key to understanding how God's moving in terms of provision for his people. And uh, so Israel goes, so goes the church of the world in a lot of ways. Now, we know that Israel has its issues of sin, just as America does. In fact, our sin kind of has been exported to Israel in a lot of ways for the Western sins of sexuality and um, uh, issues of abortion and, and, and not preserving life. These things have been exported. So it's not to say Israel is perfect and therefore God's going to bless them. It's just to say God is restoring Israel because he's fulfilling uh, his promises in the, his word. And he said that there will be, you know, gardens in the desert. Uh, and we're seeing that. So Israel is very clever in working together with the blessing of God and in, in how it has been growing and how it's been sustaining, how they develop technology. They have even better weaponry than we did based on technology we helped them with in the, in the beginning. So part of this is understanding the resourcefulness of Israel and how the church needs to be resourceful like Israel. Uh, but part of this too is to watch Israel because if we in our policies do one thing, but Israel is doing another thing, that, that should always draw our, we, our attention should be drawn to that. So Israel has a relationship with Russia. Israel has a relationship with Ukraine. Many Israelis came from those regions. Many people in Russia and Ukraine are Jewish. Many of the oligarchs that are being sanctioned are Jewish. So this is one of the wrinkles that we've got to consider in what's going on around the world in terms of how the world is shifting economically and in terms of payment and foreign currency uh, and how the fiat currencies are really under pressure uh, and, and in a sense, if you can understand it, if you read that zero, um, zero hedge article I put in the write-up, when more countries are moving to more of a commodity-based and backed uh, currency regime, payment regime, and economy, that's going to put pressure on those who don't do that. So you're going to have this alternative now, instead of the whole world being dependent on fiat currency, and therefore, we, with impunity in the United States, have kind of been able to get away with taking on more debt than we ought, get a, getting away with printing more money than we ought. Um, we've gotten away with it because everybody's used that currency sort of somewhat blindly because it's, it's the trusted currency. But as we sanction more people and say, oh, if you don't, if you don't adhere to our policies as the United States, we're going to put a coalition together and try to crush you economically. Israel is looking at all of this and saying, what are we going to do? Because when we have an unfriendly administration or a country that keeps changing and waving in the wind, like the United States about supporting us, how are we going to react? How do we need to directly negotiate with Russia when it comes to Iran and its, its uh, nuclear aspirations? I mean, Iran is a ally to Russia. So Israel cleverly is like trying to continue a relationship with Russia, even though it's tentative. It's kind of like a mixed, you know, um, a frenemy type relationship. And but they're keeping the door open also economically. So they're not participating in these sanctions. If anyone's paying attention to that, they're not they're neutral to the sanctioning of Ukraine and Russia. That's very interesting. And we got to watch that. So as Russia and China and other countries move more towards a, you know, a, a, whatever you want to call it, like a, a real uh, currency or a real dollar, something that's more backed by more substance than nothing, than just the full faith uh, and taxability of a government like ours, that's going to put pressure 
on the other currencies and economies. That in a sense, the more we crank up sanctions and against Russia, the more we're going to experience inflation, because the old, we're more and more isolated in doing that, and that naturally creates less supply, more demand. Our only answer is print more money, and so that that's going to be a cycle, and it's going to continue. And this is one of the dynamics we need to understand. I guess we don't need to understand it, but it's what's affecting uh, the, the shift that's going on throughout the earth. So there is there is a few things here in the discussion. We also want to continue our discussion that we had last week, which is how do we prepare for this within the church? And we kind of have two, I think there's two prongs to it, if, if you could understand this framework or follow it. One is we need to be working in our local communities to strengthen relationship and to um, uh, wherever there has been an external dependency created more and more, where we're dependent on global supply chain, we need to look at ways we can bring that back in community, bring that back in house, uh, led by the church. So that's, that's something that is blocking and tackling and working towards and getting done. That's why in, on the May 18th, we're going to hear more about what are they doing in Manatee County. But there's another component too, which is this, which is kind of hidden in the understanding of how to look at Israel. Uh, Chuck Pierce in his Passover Prophecies book had a dream and had a discussion about how he felt the Lord was saying, you need to act like Israel. You need to be creative with me and devise new ways of doing things to receive in the global supply chain that which you need. So part of it is bringing it in-house, but part of it is being clever with how do you bring parts or needed materials or whatever has been, whatever mess we've gotten ourselves into by being so freely free market that we're dependent on all, you know, everything else that's going on in the world. What Chuck is saying, and I think what God is saying through Chuck is we need to be resourceful like Israel has been from World War II till now, and look to, in the way we used to just push everybody around and everyone would trade with us, well, that's not going to happen. If we need a particular, let's say China invades Taiwan, right? So if something like that happens, we're going to have a chip problem that's like tremendously large for the whole world. So then how, we're, how are we going to supply the necessary uh, silicon and, and technology that's out there, even before we can bring it in-house, which may take 10 years or something, we've got to be clever about how we uh, are able to receive a supply, even if it's not a direct trading relationship. So in other words, the church is, needs to be thinking both globally as well as locally in order to achieve what is needed for the days ahead of what God wants to do uh, in terms of not being shut down, not being ill-equipped, not being um, without without uh, ability to resource itself. And the combination of God being able to provide something from nothing with being resourceful and working together in new ways of trading patterns, that's kind of Chuck Pierce's point, together with how do we, you know, the things we used to get shipped from Mexico, maybe we could try to build them or grow them here, which is the local community implementation. All three of these things are like practical ways of uh, how we need to look to build um, as the church becomes a rescue center for those who are going to be in more and more need. So that's a long prelim uh, opening statement here in the discussion. But what's on your hearts? Because Israel is really important to watch. And when we see a move like this, it's sort of confirming of something. Another move we see, which I didn't put in here, but I'll put it in the post, is the ruble. The ruble went down when uh, the war began against the dollar quite precipitously. But guess what? It's stronger now than it was before the war. What does that tell you? Well, what it tells me is that together with uh, Russia's rumblings of trying to get gold involved in their currency somehow, and that the fact that they have all this excess oil that they want to sell, and it's at a great discount, so it's creating an economic incentive for any nation who wants to work together with them, both in oil and in gold, like having tangible things 
and that in the face of intangible fiat currencies like in the euro. Also, Israel reduced the euro allocation even more than the US. I don't know if you saw that, but they reduced it from like 30% to 20%. So what's going on in the US is almost even worse in Europe. And they're recognizing that, they're seeing that. So when we see these moves, we know something's afoot and we know it's just further evidence of the whole world being shifted uh, as part of God's plan. And so we need to have understanding and work toward it. And finally, there are many things we can talk about in terms of, well, how do we deal with this? Uh, and I put in here on the bottom of the write-up, the storehouse inflation hedge, it has to do with the breakaway bridges that we've envisioned in terms of dealing with. Those other ways of dealing with it, and Doug, Jaden can certainly speak to that through a lot of the work that he's doing with uh, trading platforms and currencies that are based in local commodity or even food. So there's ways the church can address this. And uh, we want to be doing, we want to be, as watchmen, we want to see what's happening, what's going on in Israel, what's going on across the world. Um, we want to see and be objective about, like our nation has not been righteous before God in so many ways. We're now reaping what we've sown. We're seeing those judgments come forth. Part of that judgment is economic against and pressuring the dollar as the world's reserve currency. That trend's going to continue. So it's just, it's, it's responding to these things. So this discussion's wide open. What's on your heart? What did this stir up in you? What do you think about Israel and how they're pivoting? Um, let's hear from you all. Anyone want to uh, open up with a point, question, a, uh, uh, what they feel like the Lord has been sharing with them? Just go right ahead. Who's, who would like to go first? Peter, you have to unmute. It looks like you're talking. Dad, are you, uh, are you, are you wanting to speak or no? Just go ahead and unmute. Got it. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you go. Okay. Um, what I was, uh, my point was that our government, at least for the next two and a half years, is probably not going to change course whatsoever as far as those, uh, the, the uh, reserves and or whatever our dollar value is. Um, but it seems that other countries, and you mentioned Russia earlier, I read an article just yesterday about how Russia is planning or thinking about making the their ruble gold based or gold back, and you know uh, that would be a big attraction to a lot of countries, the third world countries around the world. Um, whereas just what you were saying, the dollar is becoming less influential in world trade, uh, and that will probably accelerate. Uh, because of our deficit situation and our uh, looming possible inability to, you know, uh, even pay the interest on our debt uh, as the interest rates rise. So now that's a separate from what we're talking about as the church and individuals and groups. How do we, considering that the government is going to do nothing to help us for this next two and a half years, what do we do? Yeah, so you're 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 hitting the high points here, that uh, these shifts are real, and if they weren't real, we wouldn't see the ruble bounce back the way it has. Absolutely. Uh, about the gold, you know, the gold plans, the, their plans for uh, somehow they haven't figured it out yet. There's still arguments between the central bank and the administration. They first said it's going to be five thousand rubles for X amount of gold, then they said it's going to be a sliding scale. They're going to figure something out because they actually, it's very clever. And if you read through one of those articles I put in there, the cleverness of, of going between the oil and the gold is they're essentially exposing the weakness of the sanctioned countries. And the weakness of the sanctioned countries is not by, backed by those things, yet they need those things. And so it's just an interesting dynamic. 
Um, Israel's wise to this. I think that's why they're shifting. That's why they're looking at, well, we're not sure if the United States is going to be there all the time for us. We have to, we have to make our own plans. We have to make sure that we're covered and we have these other established relationships. We don't just want to jump on board blindly. And I think that's very important for us to watch. So anybody else want to share? Doug, go ahead. Well, just to the point of the article that you shared and the discussion on Israel and their adjustment of their reserve currencies, um, you know, they're they're ahead of the game on these things. They're not really worried about being politically correct for the most part. And it, it is instructive. It's a recognition of the changes that are happening globally in the currency markets. I think I mentioned several weeks ago a book called Currency Wars by Jim Rickards. And and this is an indication of uh, that the competitive devaluation of fiat currencies is now uh, become obvious. You know, it's it's been happening for literally 20 years, but it's been kind of slow and and uh, and somewhat controlled. But I think now we're seeing it accelerate, and there's becoming more of a recognition that you know they're all they're all in a in a poor spot. What's interesting here is that. While this uh, recognition is happening and there's a shift away from the structure of how currencies, foreign currencies flow uh, around the world and China's set up their alternative to SWIFT and Russia's moving toward a, a gold kind of back ruble, the U.S. dollar on its chart has kind of a rhino horn right now. I mean, boom, I mean, it's it's gone way up yep. in terms of its value to other currencies and in large part, my understanding from the people that I'm reading is that that is a, a flea of capital out of Europe um, because of what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, there's a lot of other reasons for it, but it's a run. It's a knee jerk reaction run to the best uh, looking house in a bad neighborhood. That's the U.S. dollar. Right. People still see it as a safe haven in times of war. And uh, that's going to create some, there, it's just created some very interesting major cross currents in the global currency markets. I mean, you've got a recognition that things are not great. Now people are kind of running around going, where, where do I go? Oh, let's go over to where we went last time because that worked for us. That's just it. It's like the repeating of the pattern. Hey, let's go back in history and we'll just go back to that old well, but will it keep working? If you look at Japan, actually, to even further the conversation, the Japanese yen, which used to also be a safe haven, is no longer. And that gets into fiat currencies with different uh, interest rates and in interest rates uh, philosophies based on their local economy. But go ahead. No, just the last, just the last point. It's really telling that they dropped their euro reserves by 35%. That's they know that the euro is going to be one of the first to go. It is, I mean, the euro and the European banking system is just in shambles. They are in an abject panic over there about everything that's going on. And they got war on their continent, and and the euro was in a lot of trouble before this even happened. But Israel, to their credit, is looking at this and going, okay, let's just adjust to reality. So you know, to your point earlier that we have to watch what they're doing and take heed and, and, and understand that and let it inform us on, on what we're doing uh, is spot on. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to come back to you later, Doug, to delve a little bit further into like the, the local uh, approach and, you know, to my dad and other people's question, how do we handle this? And I think Grant wanted to ask a question here. He's got in the chat that how the Israel move might affect the U.S. Grant, are you there? You're muted. Sorry about that. I'm here. Just curious, you know, what your thoughts are, obviously, uh, how that is going to affect us, you know, in the long term. I think we, you know, so this is a little bit of a broader discussion, but in the same way, I'm always chiming on about how we need to not get too closely wedded politically to any party in the United States. We can't be so patriotic in the United States that we think, oh, well, our dollar will always reign supreme. We'll always be the military superpower. We'll always help Israel. 
not, you know, we will always remain as we have. I think that's the mistake. And the church needs to sort of see what Israel's doing and say, wait a minute, even though the United States is kind of going back to the old wells, is God doing that right now? And if not, we need to shift actually away from politics or aligning with political <coughs> platform and power in the U.S., including the economic power, and look to how God is doing that all throughout the earth, including and especially Israel. So how does it affect us? I think it's almost like a sign. Oftentimes Israel is like God's clock or watch on the earth. It is You look at Israel and you see what's happening there. And then you know what to do. We know what to do as the church in a lot of ways. So I think what we're learning here is the church cannot be so vested in our U.S. dollar economy that we will be useless without it. And, and if it's destroyed or leveled or judged, which it will be, we cannot really rely on that any longer. We can't go back to the old well. So if, if, if Europe and the U.S. in both administrations are going back to the old playbooks, whether you're trying to redo John Kennedy's administration or Ronald Reagan's administration or pick your favorite president's administration. Um, a lot of people like what happened under Bill Clinton. Hey, we had surpluses. Those strategies won't work anymore because everything's shifting throughout the earth. And so I think that's like how it affects us. Right? So it's like, it's a recognition, like, wait a second, we, the people of God, the remnant, have to start acting differently. And what we relied on for 400 years in our nation, like we, we really cannot rely on that or trust in it, especially instead of God. So does that make any sense? Yeah. And what about this move just the last couple of months, you know, in the Biden administration to recognize digital currency? How do you think that plays into it? So a lot has been talked about with that and uh some people think that that's like inevitable next month i don't agree with that position i think that that is a movement of where we're headed for sure that there's going to be more uh control that's going to be attempted to be put on politically through the financial uh, system through the treasury through the federal reserve that's for sure coming that is a threat um but that's not the only threat so if we just look at it as like the Marxists want to get a hold of the dollar, digitize it, get rid of our currency, and that's the problem, that's not the only problem. That's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is this global free market capitalism, the worship of money is the problem too. So if we don't recognize in the church we've got two problems, not one, we'll miss it. We just get focused on Nancy Pelosi and what she's doing, we will miss it. And so I think that's that's what I would say about the digital dollar. It's, we're definitely moving toward that. But what does it matter if it's digital or if it's paper, if it's all going to be worthless? I think it's either all way by nothing. <laughs> creates a problem. <laughs> anyway, um, hmm. I'm, I'm being community. a little simplistic in some of these perspectives, but I hope the point is made that if we get too focused on what are those darn progressives going to do to us next, we will miss the bigger issue and the areas we've got to repent of as well. That's for sure happening, no question about it. But we also have to admit, going back to the printing money, going into more debt, um, trusting in our own resourcefulness and, 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 and ingenuity like Egypt did, that's not the answer either. So we, we, we've got sort of a dual front war and the church has to repent of both things. Christopher, go ahead. Oh, I, just making a, a comment to maybe uh, have some fun and stir up discussion. <laughs> you know, now that Amazon understands the flavor of toothpaste that uh, Mr. Healy likes to use, and they recognize <laughs> that Grant uh, likes eating Apple Jacks instead of Cheerios the last few weeks, for whatever reason, uh, I'm being funny. But the truth is, they, they know what you order, they know what comes to your doorstep, they know how often and when. So the reality is, when you combine those kinds of um, technologies <laughs> and just simple awareness to a universal basic income, it becomes more and more interesting to explore the possibility that you don't need cash. If the government can simply send money 
to your swipe account at Amazon and say, here's your government cheese because you don't need to stand in line like you did back in the 1920s and 30s. It just show up on your doorstep and how wonderful. And you didn't even have to pay for it. You didn't have to go drive for it. You didn't have to waste gas to go get it. Um, <laughs> we don't have to waste the money on it. We'll just send it to you. And if we could shove it down your throat and make you choke on it, we'd do that too. So either way, all I'm saying is a lot of this digital currency stuff is really to a benefit of um, there's no need to have to figure out some of these things that were difficult in past 100 years ago. Now we know who you are. We know where you're at. We know your preferences. Um, and we've got a global delivery system that even Santa Claus couldn't figure out. And we can do this 365 days a year, not just one. So Santa's got nothing on Amazon now. They can do this every day. So oh, anyway, just to be fun, I think that's part of the interesting part of why digital currencies and other parts are evolving. Uh, Andrew Yang and other folks who are presidential emerging candidates or at least voices, they like the idea of how do we figure out this kind of um, digital technology and how, how do we just simply make this so that it's so convenient for the average American who's numb and who's just not engaged anymore. We got you, we'll take care of you. And so much of the opposite of what we're saying and talking about at Storehouse very often is, how are you taking responsibility? How are you taking personal authority for your life and for the things that God is doing, what he's entrusted to you? How are you caring for those around you? It's a very different attitude and posture when there's an element of take ownership and responsibility, not just for your family and yourself, but those near you versus sit back and just be coddled and cared for because the government's just going to send you what you need because we'll take care of you. Really different attitude, very different approach. So I'll pause there for a minute. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's absolutely a threat. It's an issue. The more that we get, you know, it can be like a strategy to get us into the world that Christopher's describing. And if uh, big corporations team up with big government, which they're doing more and more, that tyranny will for sure take place. That's a threat. Um, but equally, it's a threat if we just think the counter to that is we're going to go to war against those who will do that to us. And we're just going to keep going with our great American dream of the American might and dollar. I think that is equally a threat. And it's just, it's about recognizing both fronts. Um, but for sure, like, as we've been talking about, that's like, what, do, what are we doing? What has been, what has been even prophesied that we will do? We will become more, we will look more and more like China in the days ahead. If we don't turn back to God, China does that. China is the master at this kind of, uh, manipulation of what money you make, what you can buy, what you can sell, what you can't. And of course, we know that moves us into that end time paradigm of um, antichrist forces who will try to control all the economics. Um, we just need to realize that like there's the sins of Babylon and then there's the sins of those antichrist systems that are going to take down Babylon. Both are sin. And we've got to come out of both. Um, yeah, just, Doug, just go right up. Uh, uh, a comment about what Christopher shared there. What he's describing is one of the primary outcomes of this great reset that Klaus Schwab and the Europeans and the Build Back Betters are, which of course the Biden administration is all about, is, is all about. You'll own nothing and be happy. You'll get your universal basic income. You'll have some kind of a, a basic home provided for you and enough uh, food to keep you alive and be happy, okay? That's kind of where they're going with, with, with a lot of this. And and so, you know, the question ahead of us is the church and, and as just free thinkers is, uh, we've got a different way of looking at it, obviously. Personal responsibility, local autonomy, um, you know, taking control of our own local food supply chains, which I'm becoming more and more and more and more convinced that that absolutely 100% has to be at a foundational component designed into what we are doing. It cannot be overlooked at all. Um, but with that, with that said, 
there's now this kind of race to who can reach critical mass first, right? Uh, in their vision, the Claude Schwab's of the world who are trying to run to the finish line and you know capture the the people who are unaware, are uneducated, are not free thinkers, and get them rolled into a system that can produce enough scale that they can begin to then impose that on those of us who don't want any part of it. And then, you know, here we are on the other side, seemingly behind the curve, right? <laughs> you know, I think a lot of us feel like we're behind the curve, but I think it may be kind of a tortoise and a hare thing. I'm speaking a little bit off the cuff right now. They're running very quickly, but we need to be very uh, intentional. And Gary even said it at the outset. It doesn't seem like we know what we're doing, but yeah. God is revealing some very interesting uh, components to this as we go. And as we move forward, I believe he is going to connect what he needs to connect and the time it needs to be connected. And that when the time comes at the appointed time, uh, it will just kind of, you know, take off. And how and when that happens, I don't think any of us can see, but I can see it moving in that direction. And that's, that's why we keep kind of plodding along with what we're doing saying, all right, Lord, what's next. Um, and, and trusting that he's building out what he wants to build out, how he wants to build it according to his ways and not man's ways. Again, Isaiah 55 has been another one of those scriptures that is just pressing down on me over the last couple of months. So I'll just stop there, but no, let's not be discouraged if we, if we feel like, or, or it seems like, we don't have a lot of practice or a lot of uh, progress being made. And meanwhile, you're seeing this tremendous global run to kind of shut the gates around us. God's aware of all this and, and he, he's not concerned by it. And so I don't think we should be either. That's real wisdom. And I appreciate what you're saying about encouragement, Doug, because um, I, like you, struggle at times with like, Lord, we have been at this for so long trying so hard in so many different ways and there seems to be limited traction limited uptake um and it can be frustrating but the lord says do not despise the day of small beginnings keep going keep doing what you're doing because this is my will for you guys and one of the great assurances i i have and hopefully it's an encouragement to you guys and um, and I know Gary has felt this way at times and Christopher has felt this way at times and all of us probably have felt, felt this way at times is like, when I look back and, and see in my own life, how God can make a way when there seems to be no way, no money, no room to maneuver. And then he opens up a pathway that if God can provide for the Israelites in the desert with nothing, uh, and bring uh, bread from heaven and manna we should not be concerned. We should not be concerned that like our efforts are feeble, futile, um, because God can do anything with, with a willing heart. So I think that's like the key to it is humility, a willing heart, getting out of the self-interest, getting into the God interest, not sort of trying to recreate the days of old glory, um, but entering into the new thing and continuing to press and continue to network together with people. That's really the heart of, I feel like, what God is going to use. And he can use a little army. He can use a little thing. Like, he, he, what does the Bible show us? That all we need is a mustard seed of faith, and then God can work with that. So if we're, if we're in that purpose of how God is, is moving us, let's keep going. Let's keep encouraging one another. Let's see what God will do next because he's got some tremendous uh, things that will, I'm sure will surprise us all. Anybody else like to share with that? Christopher, go ahead. Just a, a quick footnote and follow-up. Uh, you talked about how China and other groups sometimes are, you know, we thought of more uh, a symmetrical approach to their thinking currency monetary approaches. Uh, it's also another fun thing to consider the fact that while, um, the elements of what was going on back in the early 70s, um, World Economic Forum, opening to China, Kissinger's approach with those things, all that was so common sense and writing on the wall and it's been known for decades. It's kind of like hidden in plain sight. But it's amazing to me how a handful of people just start becoming aware of it in the last several years when it's been there for several decades. So 
that goes to show you how slow um, the uptake can be. And that's why I continue to encourage us as we thought about um, that, that idea and the word of remnant in his people. Because the value in this context, just hopefully this encourages you, if you think about the extraordinary weight, and when you think about this in terms of how do you pivot uh, whole armies, whole nations, policies. Now, clearly they can decide to issue $3 trillion in debt and put checks in everyone's bank account overnight if they chose to, because we saw that happen. So they're not unwilling, hear me, they're not unwilling when they want to, to pivot. But the other benefit is, as God's people, we don't have a lot of baggage. I don't have to deal with a whole lot of junk. So all I'm saying is from a very simple standpoint, we could pivot on a dime today because if we think about it, what are we burdened with? What do we have to carry? What do we have to undo? We don't have to deal with all these other accoutrements and, and things that could be slowing us down from a policy and political and governmental and no, we're free, we're empowered with the spirit and we have the capacity and ability today to change and to do and to follow him in any way we see the Lord moving. So this is why I think I just remain more hopeful is because that, that idea of our um, strength and our ability to move and to maneuver in the midst of these times, to tack very strategically and to be very nimble is our greatest asset if we were willing to address it, embrace it, and to recognize the value of being light and nimble in this hour. And I think that's why we will still be able to overcome, or those who are able to overcome will have that kind of mindset and understanding. Those who don't, won't. Yeah, and um, it's, it's okay sometimes to face a crisis because a crisis can shake us into that posture of um, a, a, yoke, a light yoke from Jesus, my burden is easy, my yoke is light, um, willing to leave behind things that maybe aren't as important as we thought they were, and being willing to be flexible and, and, and resourceful with the, with the Lord, like together with the Lord, resourceful, opening up the possibilities that we didn't explore before. Because in our old regime, let's be honest, we just oh, I, I need to do this. I just need money to do that. Oh, I need to do that. I need money to do this other thing. And now what the Lord is saying is like, you've got to break that, you know, uh, dependency on the money alone. And you've got to be more resourceful in me, nimble, as you're saying, Christopher, and pivot to what God will show us. In that way, we can also understand like, hey, if, if, if digital currency cut us out or the dollar became hyperinflated, worthless, God can still do it. He can still make a way. Uh, Dad, go ahead. Yeah. And it just a more down to earth practical sense. And I certainly believe the Lord will take care of us. And if we trust in him, he will. But in a more practical sense, I see a terrible storm coming. Um, we're dealing with inflation now that people say, well, it's eight and a half percent. It could be as high as 10 or 12 percent at this point. And most likely, it'll probably go just like it did in the 70s toward 15 to 20 percent. Uh, and it'll be a disaster. So just in a practical sense, those of us who have what we have now, do you have any suggestions of how we would just protect ourselves? You you are softballing the question because every time someone asks me that question, what do I do with my resources to provide for the days ahead? The best thing we can do is invest within our local communities instead of in the markets and in and therefore the storehouse vision. So what, what we're going to talk about on May 18th and what Gary's team is doing down in Florida, that's what they're doing. They're taking millions of dollars off the table in the markets and they're moving it into their local storehouse, whereby they're going to reinvest in the people of their county. They are going to replace the bank for people's mortgages. They are going to invest in local companies. They are going to in, uh, invest those dollars 
into things that are more local, tangible, relational, community-based. And I think the trick is you can't depend that the, the enemy has tried to make it where every man is their own sort of uh, fort. So you have to have your own financial like um, fort and walls and ways of providing for yourself. In the days ahead, we're going to have to trust one another more. We're going to have to help one another more. It's not just going to be the days of today, which is like we assemble in faith, but then when it comes to the practical, we're all on our own. I think that's those days are changing ahead are changing like that financial independence we've enjoyed or think is like the way that everything has to work. That's the trick that gets us locked into what Christopher's talking about. But when we trust one another relationally and we can work in an alternative way and we take the money off the table out of Amazon and Netflix before it drops by another 50 percent and we put it into our local community, that's what's going to uh, help facilitate this change and shift. That's messy, that's hard, that is no, just I'll sell those stocks, but I'll buy like some other magical investment that'll give me the way forward. I think that's the trick is there's no, um, just do this. You, you, you could buy a pile of gold, like maybe that would work, maybe it won't. You know, maybe we, we just don't know. So it's like we have what we know is God cares about people, that people working together in community are the true wealth. Like out of that, we can accomplish much when we're willing to share, invest and grow together um, and reintegrate. I think that that will that will help make a way forward. I think the church has a greater role than the government in taking care of people. Uh, we've gone the other way around. We've gone to an entitlement structure um, where, you know, everyone's dependent on this program, that program, this health insurance, the other. The church was meant to be, like in the days of old, the place that people were taken care of, who were older, who were widows, orphans, the poor. Uh, we got to we gotta go back to those kind of basics in helping one another as families. That is not a, a pleasing answer if, if, if you look at the cost of it, because the cost of it is like, it's, it's a big shift. It's a big change. It's going to be messy. It's going to be maybe not so easy, but if we trust God and we can get, you know, work in that direction, he will always make a way. So I don't know if that's a helpful answer, but I think that is, that is the truth of where we're headed. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in about what we're talking about here. Um, but I really yeah. think that it's back to that biblical truth. Chris, go ahead. Stacey, I'll get to you in one moment. Yeah, as you were sharing, Greg, I just remember the, the dream I shared with the group last week. Um, you know, just a, a snippet in my mind. But basically, my, my family, we were by a river and we're giving our last fish away. Um, we're, we don't fish as a family, but we had fish and, and it was like God was really challenging us to, to give them to those who needed them and even though we needed them too but we sacrificially gave and then um and then right after that we started hauling these massive fish out of the river that were bigger than my body and it, you know that really uh, uh, that dream came back to me last week when greg shared about the transformations video and the carrots that were the size of uh the, the guy's forearm and, um, and so I just, yeah, I think God's really preparing us to be like the Acts 2 community, uh, as, as Don was even talking about at the beginning, that like we have to get back to this place of, uh, as everyone's saying, like totally trusting in him to the point where it's not going to be rational giving. It's going to be supernatural, sacrificial giving. And then in those moments where God's calling us to give our laptop away or, you know, our cell phone, who knows what, whatever we hold most dear, I think he may call us to give away as a test. Like, do you love me? Do you trust me more than this device or this money or this, you know, fill in the blank that you've, you slowly been placing your trust in and you didn't even realize it. And now I'm challenging you like the rich young ruler, he didn't call everyone to sell everything they had. 
but he knew the rich young ruler had to get give everything and start fresh for him to totally follow Jesus. Jesus didn't say, I won't build up your storehouse of finances again if you give it away. Right. He very well could have made that rich young ruler rich again someday. But um, but I think I think this is kind of like what I'm seeing in my life and Greg's been helping me, you know, one-on-one and, and, and Gary Crawford and several of you um, over the last year and a half now to just come to a place where, you know, like we're getting closer to, you know, I, I already pulled my Roth out of the stock market. And the next step is it, like, if we can sell our duplex after I can hopefully get it fixed here, um, and pay off our house here in Rhode Island. So, um, so yeah, th- those are like the, the big steps that I think I'm trying to take, but I, I'm, I'm realizing there's something more to that. Like what Greg and um, Christopher and, and Doug, you're all saying like, it's more than just taking care of ourselves and our families. Like it's who are the neighbors that God's calling us to become family with during the season so that when stuff really actually starts to get tough like it's not tough for any of us right i mean maybe it is we know people it's tough for but um it seems like those of us on this call maybe have enough reserves stored up right now and we're not actually feeling the pain but we're seeing the pain that's going to be coming like you know really hit me with gas like holy cow i looked i haven't put my notebook for a year but last year at March 3rd, I paid 251 for gas and then like paying 426 now. Like it was, it cost $50 instead of $30 to fill up my car. It's just like, wow, this is a big difference. Like I really need to start maybe like praying before I just make appointments and drive places. Like, Lord, do you want me to go here? Like, is this a good use of the gas? Um, and, and like, it's really interesting, Greg, I had no idea about Israel, you know, getting into all these other currencies. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And like, yeah, Israel is a sign. Like if we're grafted into the one new man, let's be as shrewd as serpents. And I, I don't know how we could invest in oil. Maybe some people can, but oil and gold, you know, if, if Russia is stronger than before the war started and they're getting a gold standard, well, then maybe it's time to have 10% of gold. I, I, I don't know. But all these things, you guys have all given ideas over the years. And I think um, for me, I'm just realizing like the bottom line, I'm going to have to like sacrificially give some things that I've, I've grown to hold dearer to my heart than I realized. Yeah, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that, Christopher. Uh, <clears throat> because the you know, the, what you're speaking about in your dream of uh, the bigger fish comes if we can, if we can sacrificially give with a smaller fish. It's really this matter of law of use, law of multiplication. And the sacrificial part is like, in my old way of thinking, just applying biblical concepts, I was like, okay, I've got lots of income. I have lots of money. I'm going to give the tithe. I'm going to give offerings. God's going to take care of us and me and my family, like, and that's, that's all I need. That's all I need to do. And I could just keep the wheels moving by continuing to give and continue to be open to uh, give. But still within that structure was the, I'm financially secure for our family. God is taking care of us, but I had no idea the depth of what he wanted to reveal about trust until we had to go through what we went through where we had nothing and we didn't have income and we still had those same bills to pay. And that's where the Lord stepped in and showed me and showed our family. I can do anything with or without the money. It's not about the money. And even your relationship with me is not kind of on autopilot. If you just follow the prosperity theology of you give and you give a little more and then God gives back to you and you're, you got your, you know, money pot to, to, uh, to take care of you, that, that, that itself was like a misguided notion. And it can even get mixed together with faith. Like, 
oh, you know, well, if I have even more of a money problem, you know, <laughs> I remember when we, we had absolutely nothing, I was trying to exercise my faith muscles even further by giving everything away that we would even be given by, as a gift in our, in our struggle. And the Lord had to show me like, you're, you're, that's not me. Sometimes I give you food for, I give you resources for seed, like for you to sow again on again or give away. And then sometimes I give it to you just to eat. That's your bread. So you got It's not about formula, formulaic. Like, I, I think sometimes we've kind of gotten into this formulaic Christianity that God will bless us if we follow the formula and it's just nonsense because that that's can be religious it's really about relationship and trust god says i gave you that to eat eat it okay don't feel guilty about don't giving on that like i gave you that to give like give it um i'm not saying not to tithe i'm simply saying like we need to respond as god is moving us not out of some kind of if i if I tick the boxes, God will love me more or bless me more or help me more. Well, I think that's, that's a misunderstanding of it. So when we move out of that mindset and we move into the mindset of, okay, Lord, you can make a way and provide any way you want. I'm, I need now to posture myself in humility, desperation, a desire to just surrender to what you would have the better way. I think that's when we, that's when some things open up for us. That's when some miracles can happen greater. That's when some things can come together that we had no idea were possible because all we're doing is we're just, we're truly uh, getting, we're, we're not trying to control our own knobs to make our own way. It's like we, when we get to that posture of like full submission that's when I think we can may, maybe more fully enter into God's economy and way. And we might think we're doing that as America, but if we're not, we're just, we're being a little bit blind and a little bit religious about it. So I think the, the test will come, you know, will, will people shake their fists at God when things really get difficult for us economically, or will people move into a trust posture and respond to a crisis in a good way? rather than a curse God way. Um, because I think a lot of people today real, don't even realize, as you're saying, Chris, like how bad it could get. Like, I mean, this is not bad. Like, this is like, we went through a pandemic and the stock market went up and stimulus money has been flooding all over the place. And I was just talking in our state capital about how our budget has a surplus. We had this crazy deficit, like, two years ago. And now we have a surplus. And I was like, well, why? Oh, well, we got all this federal money. Oh yeah. Cap gains. The markets went up so much. We got tons of taxes on the cap gains. And it's like, okay, that feels pretty good right now. But what about when there are no cap gains because the market's going down and there is no stimulus money because we can't afford the interest. Oh, we're actually at a natural deficit. So it could be a lot worse even though it's bad today, it could be way worse in terms of the like pain at the pump and pain in life and things like that. And I just think it, it awakens us to the reality of how God is trying to draw us closer. And we've got to, we probably have to break out of some mindsets of like how the kind of the American Christianity mindset operates today. Stacey, Yay, we got more mop, monopoly money. <laughs> right. So Stacy, you've been waiting patiently. Go right ahead. Okay, my comment is um, based upon Christopher Lucy, what Christopher Lucy was saying, um, because um, he said nimble many times um, in his um, comments. He was sharing, um, he started off with the Amazon um, topic, and, um, and then he went into nimble, and he said nimble, and we're free. We can really maneuver. We're free. And, and be nimble and it, you can maneuver and you can be rapid, but it, it, the word he used mostly was nimble. And um, when we started off the call, Greg said, um, he mentioned Boaz. And whenever Greg mentions Boaz, I'm like, Boaz was just dreamy. He was, he was, he, uh, <laughs> I love uh, that I learned that from um, Greg about that Greg um, relates his, some of these 
and a lot of his ideas, it seems to be related to Boaz. And so I was like, oh yeah, Boaz. The Lord, um, this uh, past week, I um, really learned something about Boaz, just something um, about Boaz and the temple um, that Solomon built. The temple Solomon built, the columns, the capital um, capitals, and they, um, they call them capitals and columns in the Hebrew Bible. Um, uh, those, um, the two main ones at the entrance had names and one of them was called Boaz and that means fleetness. And if you look up fleetness, it's nimble, just like Christopher Lucy was saying. So we, here we've got Boaz and what he represents in the economy and the finances of uh, what, you know, Greg is showing us um, with that. And then we've got, a, it means nimble. And um, so we're free and we're nimble and we're fleet. So Christopher Lucy could add fleetness to his words um, if he hasn't already. And um, the other one was called, he will establish. So the other one is called uh, Yakin and it's he will establish. So fleetness and he will establish. And um, those pillars, um, the way I got to studying those was um, because I didn't understand um, lilies in the Song of Songs. Why so many lilies? Why do lilies surround the flock? Why does, why do, why does the bridegroom graze his flock among lilies? Why, um, why are his lips described as uh, lilies? Um, and, oh, the heap of wheat of the bride's um, belly is described as a heap of wheat surrounded by lilies. So what is this about lilies? Well, lilies are on these columns, the, the Boaz and the Yakun column, and then also that big, um, tremendously huge um, place to clean off out in front of the temple called the sea. The sea was set um, out there and it had, uh, it was surrounded, it was actually the top of it looked like the flower of a lily and it had a capacity of um, like 11,000 gallons. And um, so anyway, just why so huge? So I think, um, I think if, if Christopher shares with us that Amazon is um, helping to make us feel really comfortable. And I also heard that Amazon, um, uh, the government is flying the it, planes, contracted planes all around to the hubs of the Amazon distribution centers and flying ill, um, uh, Ill, workers from South America and Central America, I guess, around in rotation to provide the uh, workers to keep the distribution really flowing sweet and awesome out of um, Amazon and meeting every need to make us feel comfortable. But anyway, it's, it's rotations of people coming in from other nations to um, be paid to live here and be paid a salary and then they go back and then another shift comes in. So that just, um, you know, if that doesn't get you to not want to be comfortable with Amazon, um, I, I, that kind of helps me to not be comfortable with Amazon. And then, so in the borders of, um, a cleansing place, a purification place in the borders of the lips uh, provided for us um, to the flock to be, the wheat and the harvest to be, rivers, um, it, it, the lips of the lily holding, containing the waters is like the um, rivers. Um, so, and, and they're nimble, fast moving rivers and we are free to jump in them and just get tossed along and moved along. And, and he provides the banks that hold us in. And, um, 
So and flowing, yeah, flowing that, in the river of mm-hmm, living water yeah. is like part of absolutely part of how to uh, be nimble in the spirit. You know, the, 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 the river of Ezekiel 47 where is weighted in up to the knees, up to the hip, and then it's sort of like it takes you away. So that's part of the nimbleness. Um, you know, Grant's bringing up a point here about the debt before he does. I just wanted to share another testimony of like how God can uh, cause us to think differently where we do have to be nimble. Nimble's not always just being um, very proficient. Nimble is sometimes uh, what it means. It can mean to think differently, uh, that we have to just, instead of beating our heads against the wall, like, how am I going to solve this problem? I'm in real trouble. I can't do this or pay that. I just need more money. I need more money. I need more money. Well, being nimble is when we say, okay, God, I surrender. You haven't given me any more money, so there must be a reason for this. What are we doing today? And I remember back in 2017, we had like no resources. We had no money at the time. And we were, I was trying to sell my boat. I felt like the Lord said, sell your boat. So we put that uh, for sale and it was like, it was just languishing. And, you know, I was just praying. I'm like, Lord, what, what is going on? Like, why are we going through this again? Where like, there's no seemingly way to like get some groceries for the kids or gas for the car. Uh, What is going on? So that day I was praying and I was just out on the beach And um, this wooden kayak, like a handcrafted kayak, just shows up on the beach. So I pick it up out of the water and I'm looking at it. I'm like, this is really interesting. This must be someone's like really cared for handmade kayak. It was really cool, actually. It's very artistically made. And I was like, you know, someone's really going to be missing this. So I better try to find if I can connect uh, and get this back to its its owner. So I called the police. I called the Marine police. I called the the different harbor masters uh, saying, hey, did anybody like lose a kayak? Like, and so then I found out someone got rescued and there was a mom and her son who had been out kayaking uh, out in front of, this is out in Cape Cod Bay. Um, and they, uh, had one, the mom had capsized and the, uh, Harbor master or the Marine police had rescued them, but they weren't able to recover the kayak. So thank God they were safe and brought back, but they were like, yeah, that's probably her kayak. Like they went missing and we rescued them, but they don't have that kayak. And so I was like, oh, well, put me in touch with those guys. And so we did. And the, the fellow who was the son, uh, who was a professional out of Boston, uh, both of them were Jewish. And so they came over to the house after I told them, like, where, hey, this is where we are. And like, come by and you can pick up your kayak. And, and so lo and behold, here I am praying, like, Lord, how, how are you going to make a way? Like, what are we going to do? And the guy says, like, hey, listen, thank you so much for connecting us and bringing this kayak back. I want to give you this hundred dollars as like a sign of our appreciation because my mom like loves that thing. And you, you were so gracious. And I was like, I can't take that money for like giving your kayak back. And the guy like really got adamant about it. He was like, no, I'm telling you, look, if you don't take that our money, I'm going to throw it on the ground and I'm going to walk away and you can do whatever you want with it. But I'm, no, I'm not just going to offer this and not give it to you. And so I, I decide, OK, well, maybe this is God's provision. So I, I receive his gift of the hundred dollars and that supplied for that day. That was like how God did it. And I had to God was showing me like, look, you've witnessed and helped these folks who are Jewish. That's my heart. I orchestrated this whole thing. They gave you what you needed, but you, you, you know, you didn't want to necessarily take it because you felt like bad that that would be uh, taking advantage, but it wasn't, it was just my provision. So I had to learn something new that day. And like to be nimble and flexible, I think in our thinking and our spirit, man, like is key. And let me tell you, I never would have processed like that if I weren't in the situation of just being like bare naked financially not being able to do anything to move the family forward on that in that moment of time 
So it's, it's stuff like this that I think God is saying like, Hey, if you think differently and watch what I can do, I can do anything with nothing. So just follow me and get rid of your old sort of whatever you want to call it, Babylonian way of thinking, monetary way of thinking. I mean, <laughs> here I am a, an investment banker working with billions and trillions of dollars on people's balance sheets. And I'm, I'm like struggling for how am I going to get groceries today with and a hundred dollar bills comes from a Jewish couple because I helped them out. Who knew, but that's how God is. And I think that's, we just have to recognize like, what is it that God is asking us to change our mindsets on a pivot change and, and be flexible um, and, and stop. Sometimes we can, I, I know I could be like, even get upset with God. Like, why didn't you provide this way or that way? It's kind of like God saying, well, I can do it any other way too. You just have to be open to that. Don't get distressed. Don't get like, don't freak out. Like, just trust me, just believe. So thanks for listening to that little bit of a testimony. Um, I, Grant, you're back to your point here. We are, we're going from the macro to the micro and that's okay. Um, Grant's talking about here, um, our national debt is $30 trillion. The government took in $4 trillion and we spent $7 trillion. This is crazy. Yes, this is the magical, wonderful world of you don't even need to uh, earn what you spend. You just keep printing the money and work the shell game between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and the bondholders. And yeah, it's... It's a little bit of musical chairs. The question is, when is, will the music stop? Uh, that is for sure, and it is crazy. It's as crazy as the t- statistic that we in America spend $50,000 per household on healthcare, yet our income per household is like seventy-five dollars or $80,000. How does that work? How does that math add up? It doesn't. How do you, you can't sustain that. Like we're all, people are crying out like access to healthcare, access to healthcare. It's like, okay, so how does that work? 50,000, make 75. Oh, you have to pay taxes. Oh, you have other things to spend money on? You need to have food and housing and everything. It, it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up personally. It doesn't add up corporately. It doesn't add, add up governmentally. We are truly in a bubble. We got to understand that. And God, God is gracious. He has time. He can work with us. It's like Doug is saying. Um, But yeah, like the writing is on the wall. Israel, I put in the write up. Israel is smelling that the writing is on the wall. That's part of that currency, uh, foreign currency reserve shift. Greg, did you want to comment further? No, good, Greg. I was just, it's just like, really nuts i mean you know how do you i mean you know it's amazing that the u.s economy brings in four trillion dollars a year i mean that's pretty you know amazing but how can we spend seven you know and like what are our politicians you know what is our government like it's just gone out the window it just like there used to be a, a a concern about you know, trying to bring the debt down. You know, I think the last time the debt ever came down was under Bill Clinton, you know, when he when he caught the vision that even though he was socially left, he became, you know, economically more conservative. And there, there was a boom in the economy back in the 90s. And we actually brought the, the national debt down. I think it was, that was the last time it came down. I mean, correct me on that if I'm wrong, Greg. Uh, yes, and that actually was a confluence of the bubble of the markets creating cap gains taxes, which helped do that too. So um, it was kind of like a, it wasn't even a sustainable uh, surplus. But I think, you know, um, what was I going to say? I was going to say um, the, the experience we went through as a family, I think is prophetically a forerunning of what the country is going to experience. So we as a family made plenty of income, had a great career, had plenty set, saved, saved, set aside, but plenty of mortgage debt as well, because that was the wisdom of 
that's the wisdom of our structure is like, uh, uh, hey, you know, you need to get a mortgage because that's tax deductible interest. Surely you can make more money in your investments than the, the bank's going to charge you a mortgage because you're more clever. Um, so just keep the mortgage debt, have more in excess of that. The net of it is your positive. Your assets are greater than your debt. You've got plenty of income. So in a sense, like then the slide for us was like, okay, okay, we're following the Lord. And I'm assuming like, okay, he'll just provide the same income and like the same, we'll have the same cushion or resource base to operate from. But that didn't happen. And I think that's going to happen in the nation too. Like for a while, you can kind of carry on uh, without that income. And then the debt increases and then you spend down the reserves that you have. And then all of a sudden you're upside down. And then all of a sudden you're, you're kind of in this crisis bind. I think that that's probably coming for the nation is we've chosen that route of like, no, debt is good. Debt is smart. Debt is how we fund things. Like we need to have debt to do municipal projects. We need to, you know, oh, we got to build a school. We need to issue a bond. We, we need to do this. We got to issue some debt. Um, the problem is that if you don't have enough income and you run out of your cushion, you're, you're in a very precarious position and then everything shifts. So that old game doesn't work anymore. Um, and I think that's, that's a little bit of a prophetic forerunning of what we're seeing the nation entering into and thank God for his mercy and grace and his time, because, uh, you know, we could have blown up. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, but we haven't. But this is the opportunity where we can really sort of pay attention, listen to these testimonies of lessons learned, and then understand that this is going to happen and uh, see it and, and prepare accordingly. Well, not, in, not out of our you, own solutions, but out of heavenly wisdom. Grant? Greg, we nearly blew up with the financial crisis, right, Rich? You know, they ended up, you know, putting a Band-Aid on it, right, and borrowing more money and setting us. At that time, the national debt was $10 trillion. So since that time, the national debt has grown $20 trillion. Correct. And, you know, they just, there's just this belief that it doesn't matter anymore. Just print the money, you know, and uh, it's, it, it's just... Um, you know, it's, it's a bubble waiting to burst, you know, it's just, it's God's timing when he decides, I guess, to, uh, for that to take place. Yeah. It's tr again, it's, what is it trusting in the, uh, our governments, our elected officials, our people individually, corporations, they're trusting that the debt structure and base system will continue to work. So let's just like keep hitting the button. You know, we kind of went into a little bit of an aggressive deficit, but hey, we didn't we didn't die. Well, let's make it a little bigger and a little bigger. Oh man, like we can just keep going with this. Like it's easier to go this way, but where it ends up is it's just the taller you are, the harder you fall. And I think that's sort of where we're headed. So and guess who know. they'll blame when it eventually bursts? They'll they'll blame me, Grant. No. Nope. Like, They'll blame the Jews. I know. I know you're going to say that too. They will. And it's just like a classic pattern of uh, watch anti-Semitism grow as economic hardship uh, comes. And interestingly, God can even use that, right? To bring the people of Israel back to him and back to the land. So, Amen. hey, uh, Joel, good to see you, brother. That is a hey, high, high haircut you. you got there, man. Thank you. Legend kept pulling my hair, so it was it was time. Um, the um, something that you had touched on was about healthcare and just kind of how the math doesn't add up, yes. right? Um, and something that's interesting, you know, like talking about the the economic forecast, so to speak. Um, but then there becomes that question of like, how do we as the body, you know, respond? Um, and I was talking with somebody who had. Christian healthcare, um, who basically it's, um, there were, there were laws made federally to allow for this, um, because of how the Amish do healthcare. Um, 
And what ended up happening is these Christian healthcare companies popped up, also some that were just kind of scams, but these Christian healthcare companies popped up um, such that you could pool funds together to pay for people's medical expenses, but also, um, so it worked like insurance, like an insurance network, but then um, when there was like a need, like so-and-so in Texas needs this, um, people could just like give to that, people that were in this network. Um, but, right, um, you know, this person moved, you know, lived in Connecticut and Yale New Haven Health didn't risk, like accept that as insurance. And if Yale New Haven doesn't accept your insurance in Connecticut, like you don't have healthcare in Connecticut. That's basically how it works because of this kind of uh, near monopoly on healthcare in Connecticut. Um, but um, the, the issue more so was around the, the proximity and nearness of this community, right? So um, while the, the network extended to anybody in the US, it functioned best in closer communities where it's like, you know, you're getting, you know, notifications about this person in Texas when you live in Connecticut um, and you may be willing to help, but you're actually not being supported in the way that you need to be because of how the networks work in Connecticut and, and functionally, right? These things work regionally. They work when the body is working together and there are actually these relationships. Um, and so there's there's something about how like responding to the the imminent threat of like economic hardship looks like building and growing in Christian community, um, growing in these values, and um, almost with like the economy being like something in your peripheral, um, where it's like you're so focused on your community, you're so focused on. Um, the love of Christ and like growing in that, right? Um, that these peripheral things um, actually function as peripheral things. Like, oh, this thing is actually happening over there, but like where we're focused, um, we have what we need. Um, and that that's really what I what I drew from that was just like actually like it's it's the the nearness, the oneness, the closeness of of Christian community. Um, the oneness in Christ, right? Not just like, I mean, there's a lot of unity in different spaces that are around Christ, but the that that unity in Christ um, is the type of thing that can make the waves, you know, you think about Peter on the water, it can make the waves peripheral instead of the focus that is affecting us and you know, causing us to sink. Yeah, and you know, that's, that's a good pickup that which is like a uh, large part of what we talk about in terms of the way forward is it's got to be it's got to start in local community and that's an example of that but also equally it's an example of how Yale New Haven uh, healthcare didn't accept that means um, and even if they did Yale New Haven is passing along all of their costs and infrastructure costs and unfortunately we're still at that fifty thousand dollar level so it's not just insurance cost that that stat is, it's actually the cost of the hospital network, the doctor's network and everything else. It's very, very, very expensive. And the only, my, my point there is like, it's just not financially sustainable, but yes, the answer is when we do both sides. So MediShare is like an example of a Christian healthcare program model after the Amish, like part of the healthcare provisions, uh, healthcare act allowed for these private networks that solves some of the issue which is the insurance side but then there's the other issue which is just our healthcare industry is like so large now it is it, we have incredible healthcare in the u.s no question about it but like universities charging more and more tuition fueled by student loan debt our healthcare system has grown and grown and grown fueled by federal debt, state debt, um, so on and so forth. So like, it, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's not in a sustainable situation. Rafiq. Yes. You're, you're uh, a doctor. Have, what do you think? Uh, well, the doctor has a question. <laughs> uh, it may sound like a naive question, but I've been listening to this, you know, a lot of wisdom about the financial changes and all this gold, Bitcoin, everything. 
And there's a lot of wisdom here. My question is, as I said, naive question, why do people in the federal government like FOMC and all this are able to think wisely? I mean, why, why don't they see the problem? Because they see the problem, but they don't think the consequence is the rational consequence. They, they look at it as like, well, another way of uh, just explaining this is some people talk about it as modern monetary theory. Have you ever heard of that? Modern monetary theory, MMT. And what that basically means is that, you know, it never worked in history, but today we're so technologically advanced in how our economies function and are globally interdependent. Modern monetary theory is, well, when we print more money, we won't have inflation because, because, because. And I have economists lined up speaking to back this up. So if that makes sense to you, essentially there are economic theories for modern monetary theory of uh, going into more debt and, and increasing the money supply isn't necessarily a bad thing. So it's like okay. trying to fool yourself into thinking it's no, it's not a problem because things have changed. And now like you can print more money and the GDP will continue to grow as long as the GDP grows greater at a greater growth rate, then you should be fine. We can grow our way out of the problem. There's all sorts of economic theory behind it, but yeah, that's, that's, that's perhaps why. Okay. And because the fear of the Lord is the start of wisdom. Yes, right, right. You know, they, they don't have God in their plan. Well, I think it makes sense what you said, Greg, that they don't re see, uh, they're short-sighted about the consequences. That's, that's, that's the uh, answer that I received, you know, from what you, meant, what you explained to me. Yeah, and, and look, I, I got to say, like, the path that we took by faith, I also thought, you know, well, uh, this is different. It's different, but there's an analogy in it. The difference was we were being obedient to God to the missional call and just shift of our business model. That then caused like losses and further dipping into savings, eroding it down where our debt became bigger than our assets. And the, the trouble was, I thought that God was going to supply, I don't know if this is the only trouble, but part of this, the dynamic was I felt like, well, we have in faith been obedient to God. Therefore, he will bring forth the solution to our problems with money. We will have a big check come right at the finish line. We will have more capital come into our investment business right at the last minute. And I, I was always looking to it as like, well, you know, this, I had my own monetary, you know, uh, modern mon monetary theory, which was like, well, God will just come in with the helicopter money because i'm trusting him and then god came in instead with you're trusting too much in the money as well as trying to add me to it so i've got to show you like greg i gotta break you from the the idea that i can i have to solve all your financial problems with money i can solve them all sorts of ways be open to it be nimble be flexible he called he called it learn new tricks so we're talking about being nimble today in our thinking and response to god that was what the Lord showed it to me as he showed me as like, just in the same way as you're a kite surfer and you uh, have different tricks or like if, if you're a surfer, you express yourself and you have these different tricks that you perform that are fun. Um, it's like the Lord was saying, I need to show you that a new tricks about how to do things, which was a, which was an analogy to be flexible in your thinking. It's not just a million dollars that will fix your trouble. Yes. It can be all sorts of other ways that I need to open up to you by always making it about the money. We need more debt. Like we need to print more money. We need to have more money. I'm showing you, Greg, that you're like too attached to your money and that you, you trust in it more than you think you do. When you say you're trusting me, you're actually trusting in your bank account, your income, your ability to work and things like that. So when I say trust me, I have a little bit of a different way of thinking than you do. So start thinking like, be, be more creative and nimble in your thinking. Think as I do. I can do all things. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, hey, Thank we're you. at the... <clears throat>
Anything else you wanted to share? That's fine. You know, I just, you know, understood what you mentioned. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, uh, we're at the top of the hour here, a little bit past. So great discussion today, as always. Anyone else have any final uh, thought or would like to close us in prayer? I'll, I'll close us in prayer, Greg. And I just want to, Lord, we just thank you for all this that's been brought forth. We pray that you would seal it up in our heart. I know it's been recorded, but you would lock it into us, Father. Make it a living, breathing, functioning, operating part of who we are as new creatures, you. Lord, draw us into the life of the kingdom. Open up our eyes on every level. Cause us to enter into all elements and aspects of, of your kingdom as we faithfully and accurately represent you, dear God, as you bring forth what you will herald your coming kingdom through us. We pray that we would not only believe you when we have to, but Lord, we would believe you because it's the right thing to do. We would trust you because it's the right thing to do, Father. Cause us to believe you and trust you not when the stuff hits the fan, but before, Lord, make all your people bring in them to be early adopters in your kingdom, early full adopters. And we thank you for it, Lord, for blessing each and every soul. Give us experiences this week so that everybody comes back with a testimony next week of how you have transformed our life along these lines with specificity. We thank you for it, Lord. We receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Hallelujah. And I pray that we each can learn from our, uh, our brothers and sisters experiences and testimonies as well. Hey, thanks everybody. Love you guys. Great discussion this week. Have a great week coming up. We'll see you next time. See you. Thank you. God bless you. God thanks, bless Greg. you all. Thank you. Okay.